Ah, a good vach and a early uh, good yantiv. There is a uh, argument among various commentaries in the Talmud about what exactly happened in the story of Hanukkah. When did they win the war? When did they uh, find the jar of oil? Some say that the war was won on the 23rd day of, of Kislev. The cruise of oil was found on the 24th day of Kislev. The menorah was lit on the 25th day of Kislev. So today is, of course, a day of great miracles then. They, they won the war. Tonight is, of course, a day of a miracle finding the cruise of oil. But what's the miracle about the 25th day of Kislev? So there are many answers to this question. One answer is that when the Maccabim are in the base of Megdash, they're in the temple, they find only one cruise of oil. It's not something which seems significant because it's only going to last for a day. And yet the miracle is that they didn't look at what was going to happen the next day. They didn't look at their being able to light the menorah for a day as something puny and insignificant. Instead, they looked at the fact that God had chosen them for this circumstance and this place, and that God had given them the, the ability to light the menorah, and to bring light to the world for one day. And they said, this is what God has given us, this is what we're going to do. And that's also the story of Yosef. Yosef is in prison, and despite the incredible suffering that he experienced personally, yet the Torah says that Yosef looks around the prison and he sees the butler and the baker and their faces are down. He says, why are your faces so down? Why the long faces? And because he asked that question, they told him their dreams. And because they told him their dreams, there was a redemption for Joseph. And really, not just for Joseph, but that changed the whole world because when Joseph became the advisor to the Pharaoh, Joseph was able to use the seven years of plenty to nourish the whole world. So it gives us a very great insight to our, ourselves and thinking about the responsibility we have with the resources that we have, with the specific place and time that God has placed us. We have to look around and take responsibility for our surroundings. A kind word, a compliment, a favor, a genuine smile. We have a, God has empowered us to light up the world, each of us in our own place in the world. And though you may not know what's happening tomorrow, but you have to focus on whatever you could do today and let God do the miracle of tomorrow. But tonight is not yet Hanukkah. We're not yet lighting the menorah. Tonight's the 24th night of Kislev. It's a time of finding the cruise of oil. And the cruise of oil on a personal level means finding the purity in yourself, not judging yourself based upon your past not thinking that you are a certain way because of mistakes that you made and limiting yourself and judging yourself and not expecting too much of yourself. But find the cruise of oil means believing in your inner goodness, believing, believing in your purity, believing in your, in your neshama. And with that faith in yourself, finding the potential to illuminate not eight days of Hanukkah. So on that note, I want to share with you several stories about this power of finding the cruise of oil um, that we see that the Rebbe um, did in many different ways. I'm going to begin with the story of a couple. This, um, this couple uh, were Holocaust survivors and they had really um, not... This really not planned to keep Judaism, but because um, the husband had visited the Bavitch Rebbe and he'd seen miracles at the Rebbe's court, this really inspired him to want to continue his Judaism. And not just to continue his Judaism personally and privately, but to wear a beard. And generally, um, the halacha is that if a wife doesn't want her husband to have a beard, so the husband is supposed to agree to the wife and not to have not to grow his beard. But in this circumstance, there's a very unusual letter I'm going to share with you that the, the Rebbe actually talks to the wife and explains to her why she should encourage her husband to have the beard. And not just not only did the Rebbe not only were the Rebbe's words helpful for their relationship, but 
after the Holocaust, all they had been through, what the Rebbe had said was a bomb for her heart and kindled that last cruise of oil. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you a little bit about who I'm talking about. There is a um, famous Chabad family, I hope I'm not mispronouncing it, uh, Rabbi Mrs. Yehuda Pladi, Aleya Mashalom. Rabbi Pladi was, um, a, a uh, before the war, was a great Torah scholar. He was a student in the Presburg Yeshiva. The Presburg Yeshiva is famous because I was a Yeshiva that the Chassam Sofer led and his son, the Ksav Sofer, and his grandson, Rabbi Yeshua Boxpoim, uh, who was the head of the Besden of Magendorf, and he unfortunately was killed in Auschwitz, so he taught this, this, this Yehuda. But because of his experience in the Holocaust, he didn't plan to, um, to continue studying. His, his um, teacher, the son of the Ksav Sefer, um, I'm sorry, Yeshua Boxenboim was, was the head of the yeshiva he was in, the rabbi, the city he was in, was Rabbi Shimon Sefer. And he was, you know, he was brought up with these incredible Torah giants. And yet after the Holocaust, he really didn't feel that, that this was for him anymore after all he'd been through. But through a series of events of divine providence, he ended up coming to visit the Rebbe. And while he was in Israel before visiting the Rebbe, he had a, he was in a car accident. And he had tried many different operations to heal his leg. And he came before the Rebbe, and the Rebbe was giving out wine after Simchas Torah, Kosho Bracha, as Rebbe would do every, every Simchas Torah, after Simchas Torah, the Rebbe gave out wine, wine for a blessing. And this, this Rebbe David, he comes before the Rebbe, and with a, with a cane, as he always did, because he was in this car accident, and doctors couldn't help his leg because, and so he had to walk around with a cane at a very young age. And so he comes by the Rebbe, and the Rebbe tells him, you don't need, the darkness to shteken, you do not need this cane, you don't need this stick. He didn't hear what the Rebbe said, so he kept on holding on to the cane, and he walked a few more steps. And if you exil rap, all of a shalom, who had the pleasure of learning from him many times, exil rap, he goes over to the guy, he realizes he didn't hear what the Rebbe said, and he grabs the cane away from him. So he didn't hear what the Rebbe said, he doesn't know why this guy's taking away his cane, and he runs after Rabbi Kassil Rap to try to get his cane back, not realizing that <laughs> he's able to run. And indeed, he doesn't need the cane anymore. A total miracle. He never again needed that cane, and he used to. He kept that cane when he came back home. He kept that cane. He hung it up on his house, and he kept that cane his whole life, hung up in his house to remind himself of the total and obvious and blatant miracle he saw. The Rebbe's words: "You don't need the cane." Parenthetically, I this didn't only happen one time by the Rebbe. Whatever just told someone suddenly you don't need a cane. I heard from Rabbi Fall Sweat. Al Shalom from Mexico City, that he was on uh, using a cane. He was, I think he was actually using crutches, if I remember correctly. And he passes by the Rebbe, and the Rebbe says to him something which he didn't understand. And maybe the Rebbe said it in Yiddish. And he asked people around them, What did the Rebbe say? And they told him, the Rebbe said, You should have a complete recovery. A complete recovery? Oh, really? So he has a lot of, a lot of faith, in, faith in the Rebbe. He immediately threw away his cane or his scratches, whatever it was, and that's it. And he was done with it. So you can imagine, after being by the Rebbe, coming back, he, he was very excited, and he decided he wants to grow a beard. The problem was that his wife, Rebetzin Adol uh, Pladi, she was born in the Hasidic town of Dorovich in Galicia. And... She, her, her parents called her uh, Adol after the Baal Shem Tov's daughter, Adol. By the way, the name Adol is an acronym for the words Eish Das Lomaya, the Torah is a fiery covenant. And uh, she, during the Second World War, had to endure incredible suffering, literal torture. 
um, when the Nazis came to the city of Dorovich, uh, during that time, they, they had a, they, there was a pogrom on all the Jews in Dorovich for three days straight, in which the, the, there were also collaborators from the, Pol- the, the Ukrainians and the Polish, and they killed Rahman al Slan, so many Jews during, those three, during that three day pogrom. So th- the thousands of Jews that lived in Dorovich, uh, were, who, those who survived, many of them went into hiding. And so did her family as well. In the summer of 1943, uh, the ghetto of Dorovich was eliminated. And the Nazis went through all the homes in Darovich and burning the homes in order to, to uh, find who was still hiding in those homes. Until the, um, and, and of course, many, many Jews were killed during this, this time. So Rebetz and Pladi, um, she, Survived in a, in a very under very harsh conditions. She was was they, they found a place to hide, a place without water, a place without electricity, a place which was very very tiny, a little bunker, and deep in the ground. Just for example, like her little sister Tunya, once went out of the hiding place and was immediately killed. Rachman by just went to get some air and she was immediately killed by a Nazi. Rabbitson Pladi and her father. Only they, her, her father, Yeshua, only she and her father remained alive. The entire family was killed. And that's how they survived. She and her father um, were, uh, went to Israel. Now, her husband was killed by a Nazi who had a beard. And because he was killed by someone who had a beard, she had a trauma from beards. So when her husband came home wearing a beard, it was very hard for her. And she wrote a long letter to the Rebbe explaining to, her, to the Rebbe that this is telling the Rebbe the events of her life and how, how the kind of trauma she experienced and why she just can't imagine having someone in her life, in her home, wearing a beard. I'm going to share with you the Rebbe's letter. And I wanted to say before I share the letter, this, these words, again, were a bomb for her soul and caused a total transformation in her and her husband and relationship and their whole direction in life for the rest of their lives. Deborah writes, I don't, although I don't, rec- I don't know you personally, but since I heard a lot about you from your husband, Rabbi Yehuda, so I'm going to permit myself to turn to you with the following lines, and I hope you won't get upset. After your husband has written to me several times, I've gotten to, to know your husband when he visited here for a relatively long amount of time. And based upon our conversations several times, where he has told me different events of his life, I was happy to see that he found something, he found inner peace in his soul by connecting more to the perspective, to, to the Volta on Sham, to the perspective of the world, a world perspective that emanates from our Torah, the Torah of life, the Torah of truth. When, when, in other words, when her husband started embracing the Torah ideology, that made him, that gave him peace. After all he's been through in the Holocaust, by him embracing the Torah, the Torah of life, the Torah of truth, that gave him a, a, a inner soul peace. A peace that brings to inner good fortune, and the peace that brings to fortune, to Osher Nafshi, to fortune of soul. So certainly, Rebbe says, your husband coming closer, which the result of this, our harmony and good fortune are possible with the assistance of the Asia Kanegda. The Torah says that a wife is called a helper to her husband, meaning the Azer, meaning the wife, meaning you. And this this um, this, this this perspective uh, became resonated with me hearing from your husband about the assistance that, that he found in you and especially your assistance in the aforementioned in his becoming closer to Judaism. So it's so unnecessary to, to, tell, to speak to you at length about the necessity of a person to have 
inner peace and harmony in order that the life can be the life that's worth living. In order for a person to have life worth living, they have to have an inner peace and harmony. Especially in our time, our tumultuous time, tumultuous both for, for, for the community and tumultuous for the individual. And therefore, the Rebbe says, I, I strongly hope that just like in the past, so too in the future, you should be the right hand of your, you should stand to the right of your husband, also in his coming closer and his advancing in Judaism further. And as everything that's alive, whenever it's something, that's, there's something that's alive, it always grows. So my, my intent is, Rebbe says, that both of you together should go and ascend in life together according to our Torah, the Torah of life. With all that I've written, Rebbe says, I, I want to specifically address directly what you've written to me about. In other words, until now, Rebbe was just speaking in general about coming closer to Torah and being supportive of her husband making a step, making steps in his Judaism, how her support will help him to have harmony and peace and how that's so necessary for a person to live life the way life is meant to be living. You have to have harmony and peace and therefore when he makes a step in his Judaism, your support is, is really important for him to have um, life worth living, to have harmony in life. Then the book goes and, can, and addresses her specific issue again that she said, she wrote to the Rebbe, my, my first husband was killed by a Nazi without a beard and I don't want my husband to have a beard. The Rebbe continues and says, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing from the Hebrew. My, I, I decided that I want to write to you explicitly. And the intent of writing is to express hope and together with encouragement and strength. In other words, I says, I want to not just write. My intent of writing is to give you strength and hope. Sometimes a person in their life encounters this, when you first start to advance their Judaism, they encounter difficulties. And especially when you meet people who haven't reached a stage in life that you're in, you know, or you've advanced in Judaism, someone else hasn't. So when you meet people who haven't reached a stage you are in life, so what do they do in order to make themselves feel better that they're not up to where you are? So what they do is in order to strengthen themselves in their own eyes, in the eyes of others, in the eyes of, of other creatures, in the eyes of anyone else, what they do is that they ridicule People have made strong steps in their Judaism and, and they've reached a higher step in their world, in their, in their Voltan Chang, in, their, in, their, in our Torah and our faith. People have reached a higher level. So others who are on a lower level, in order to make themselves feel better, what they do is they ridicule those who have advanced to a higher level in order to make themselves feel better, look better in the eyes of others. So our sages have encouraged us and warned us do not be embarrassed because of those who ridicule you. Because the reason our sages specifically encouraged us, are, encouraged us uh, uh, is because they knew that it's not an easy, easy thing. To be ridiculed is not an easy thing. Uh, and I mean specifically, a, a, th this specific aspect, growing a beard, which your husband, while he was here in New York, he began to grow a beard. And growing a beard is, in the language of our sages, is called the garment of God. And it gives a, a Jew an image of God, as it says in many places in the Talmud. Something that, for your husband, was not easy. Again, mainly because of those who scorned him because he grew a beard. And yet, without any influence from the outside, from himself, he started to do this. And apparently, this also added to his inner peace and his recognition that he's standing on a strong uh, foundation of the Torah and its commandments. And that's the main point of my writing this letter to ask you to express my hope that you also, that you also assist your husband and encourage him to continue this with joy and peace. It's understood, the Rebbe continues, that I know that there are many Jews who keep the Torah who do not grow beards, and there are many opinions about this. However, I'm not talking about this from the perspective of halacha. I'm only talking about this from the pers mainly from the perspective of the life of this individual who we are talking about. 
In this situation, it's not just that he is satisfied and happy that he has a beard, but it's a lot more than that. This growing of the beard is, is for him, for your husband, is something that's connected to all the other steps he's made in his Judaism in the last couple of years. And it's also connected to, to, to your relationship with him as he, and your husband has told me how you have added light and life in his life. And certainly and certainly and certainly the Rebbe says that when you've added life to him, that has also added life to you. So it's understood that your husband's advancement in his Judaism is far more important than all the scorn that he is getting from, uh, from a few individuals in his surroundings. Again, the only purpose of those who scorn your husband is just to, in order to justify to the, in the eyes of the person who is scorning your husband for having a beard, the reason they're doing this is just in order to, for them to justify their own lifestyle. And, and something, you know, the person is disturbed from time to time about what level he is on, therefore he goes out and he ridicules others. And the easiest way to feel better about yourself is to ridicule others. I want to add another point that says, in this subject, and this is a fundamental and important point, I want to quote the words of the Tzemach Tzedek, who said that having a beard is something that brings God's blessings in abundance, both in quantity and in quality, and this is misunderstood. Anyone who needs a blessing, um, especially someone who needs a blessing in health, or blessing in finance, and how much more so, if you need a blessing in something spiritual, he should hold on to this step very strongly. Especially in this situation, we were promised by our sages that if someone wants to become pure, God assists them to become pure, the great assistance, and the Rebbe concludes, may it be God's will that God should help you also in your personal resources, your home, in a way that satisfies you, and you'll be blessed by God in all that you need, both spiritually and physically, and you should have good news in all the things that we, that, that, um, that we spoke about. So that's the conclusion of the letter. And that's these words that have, again, they, they totally lifted her up and set their home not just to be in a state of peace, but, but more that they, they, she and her husband became one of the most prominent Chabad Hasidim activists in the Rebbe's uh, campaigns to strengthen, for example, uh, who was a Jew, and other campaigns that the Rebbe began in Israel. That's the first story I wanted to share. And I'm going to continue now with three other stories about Calcutta, Uganda, and Kenya. I think Calcutta with a Yiddish accent, because when I was studying the yeshiva in Los Angeles, it was Hanukkah, and the Rebbe was talking at a event called Hanukkah Live, where there was a satellite hookup connecting Hong Kong, Melbourne, New York, Paris, and Jerusalem, all looking at each other, it was something very unique at the time, 1992, and everyone's looking, lighting the menorah together at the same time. It was a very fascinating event, and the Rebbe spoke at the event, and at this event, I remember listening to this, the Rebbe spoke about people looking at, at, at a, a one candle, lit in one place, the whole world could see it, and the Rebbe mentioned, among other places, not Paris, not Jerusalem, they haven't mentioned Calcutta. Why they mentioned Calcutta, I didn't know. And no one around me I was studying yeshiva, no one knew either. But I found out that there, in, back in 2001, two Chabad students, Rameir Baich, who's now a rabbi in, in, in Kfar Saba in Israel, uh, Besheva, he went to visit the city of Calcutta and he met the president of the community. And the present community said that in 1992, he was in a hotel room in Calcutta, and he wasn't connected to the Jewish community there at all, the small community that was living there then. And he wasn't, he was, just, he was by himself in this, in this hotel room, and he was thinking it's Hanukkah, but why is she like the menorah? What for? Why is she like the menorah? What's going to even do like the menorah? What, what, what's the point of that? Just, he just, what's, what, what, what will his candle do? That's what he was thinking. And he decided to do what every good, every good American does and doesn't know what to do. He turns on the television and flips the channels. And flipping the channels, and he, he passes by the Rebbe 
speaking at this Hanukkah live event. And again, the Rebbe is speaking about lighting the menorah in Calcutta. And you can imagine what this did for him. Like, he's the guy lighting the menorah in Calcutta. And the whole world's looking at, at France and Australia. And the Rebbe is saying, but there's a Jew in Calcutta and he's lighting the menorah. You can imagine what kind of a total affirmation and encouragement that gave this Jew, this lonely Jew in the middle of Calcutta. Last story. Rabbi Yossel Weinberg al was once in an audience with the Rebbe. And the Rebbe said to him, he was then planning on a trip to South Africa. And the Rebbe said to him, since you're going to visit South Africa, there is a small community in Uganda, and it's worthwhile that you should go to visit Uganda on your, as, you're, as, as you're traveling to South Africa, go also to Uganda. Rabbi Weinberg said that he doesn't know much about the map, doesn't know about anything about Uganda and its um, proximity to South Africa. But the Rebbe says... That's the main thing he has to do on his trip to South Africa is to visit Uganda. So he, um, he, he took a trip to South Africa and he found out that the only way to get to Uganda is through Kenya, to Nairobi. So he travels to Nairobi and in Nairobi he uh, meets the small Jewish community in Nairobi and he tells them that he is the reason he's there is just to go to Uganda. And they're very surprised because all the rabbis who visit Kenya, none of them go to Uganda. No one goes to Uganda. People are traveling from Israel to go to collect funds for the yeshivas or any other worthy cause. In, 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 uh, for whatever reason, no one goes to Uganda. Why is he going to Uganda? And they actually know that that's my purpose and my trip is to go to Uganda to visit the Jews in Uganda. Anyways, you can't really know, never sends you somewhere, what the main point is. Of course, Rebbe knows that the only way to get to Uganda is through Kenya. So while he's in Uganda, he um, was able to inspire many Jews in Uganda. For example, uh, when, he went to, um, uh, when he went to Kenya, he couldn't immediately travel from Kenya to Uganda. He had to stay there for Shabbos. So after Shabbos, like we were having Lava Malka, he told the Jews in Kenya, let's have Lava Malka together. So the few Jews living in Kenya, they had Lava Malka. And one of the Jews who was there was a Belzer Chassid who had not been in touch with his Judaism for such a long time and he was saying a Hasidic story and he was saying a Hasidic melody and this guy really was so excited about this and he said I haven't tasted this for 40 years he was so excited and he maintained the connection in was Saul if I know correctly and Saul and Rabbi Weimar made a connection for a very long time to the extent that because of his visit there, Saul decided he has he can't he can't uh, stay in Uganda. Interesting thing, he moved with his wife. He went, he went, he, they were on a trip to, in London, and while they were in London, they were considering whether they should go back to to uh, Nairobi or move to Israel, and they were having an argument about it. And he, he sent Rabbi Weinberg a letter asking, or he called Rabbi Weinberg rather, asking him, "Can you please come to London to talk to us?" about whether or not we should leave and go to Israel. So he asked the Rebbe if he should go to London to talk to them. And the Rebbe said, The Rebbe's words were, he is a, a supporter, he is a philanthropist, and you should give in to him, and, and yes, go for it. Anyways, that's just an interesting uh, postscript. But he influenced this man and many others to come close to Judaism. In fact, he was staying in a hotel in, in uh, Kenya, in Nairobi, and he said, in, in this hotel, it was so primitive that there was no telephones in the hotel. So you, to, you rang a bell, and then one of, the, uh, one of the employees of the hotel would run up to your room and say, what do you want? So he sent a note in English to the front desk. Can you please send up a hot water and two raw eggs? He wanted to make eggs with some hot water. So he received a note back in Hebrew. Ulai ha'adon gam mashu acher. Sign Gaula Cohen. Maybe this man, this maybe you would also like short and respectful in third person. Maybe you would also like something else. I could help you with something else. Hebrew, middle of the hotel in in in, in Kenya. Gaula Cohen. What's going on? How's there Gaula Cohen writing to him? What's going on? So he went and he spoke to this woman, and this woman apparently she was living in in Israel, and she became friendly with a British soldier. And 
unfortunately, they got married, and he was and he moved to uh, to Kenya, and he became a um, he worked in an airport in Kenya, in Nairobi, and they they lived together. And she so asked her, "Do you have any children?" She says, oh, "I have a son and I have a daughter." And and is it, are you happy? She started to cry. I'm not happy. She said, "My son and daughter had a fight recently, and my son, my daughter." I felt she was wrong, and I sided with my son. When I sided with my son, my daughter screamed at me and said, you dirty Jewess, you dirty Jew. How, how dare you have an opinion? Your opinion is worthless. You're a dirty Jew. I'm thinking my daughter is telling me that I'm a dirty Jew. This is the wrong place for us to be. So she said, what should I do? So at that time in Kenya, there was a certain Rabbi Erman, an Orthodox rabbi, and he told her that you have to encourage your children to have a Jewish education. And Baruch Hashem, many other things happened as a result. But getting back to his trip to Uganda, so eventually he leaves Kenya, he goes to Uganda. In Uganda at the time, there were 18 Jews living there, only 18 Jews. And he, he uh, discovers that there, is, there are no mezuzahs at all in the, entire, in the entire country. Nobody has a mezuzah. And he had with him a lot of mezuzahs. And the first thing he did was he brought every single Jew there a mezuzah for their home. So just sharing how as we're approaching Hanukkah and the day before Hanukkah, you're supposed to find the cruise of pure oil in your heart and to realize and believe in your own innocence, your own purity, and not to judge yourself based upon your past. So thinking about the Rebbe, our Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu of our time, and how he sees there's a Jew in Uganda who needs a mezuzah. There's a Jew in Calcutta who needs light as menorah. And realizing that it's, and there's a couple over there, and this couple hasn't having an issue because her husband uh, has a beard, and her, and her first husband was killed by a Nazi who had a beard. And, us, and, and the Rebbe's ability to reach into every Jew's heart and to find their way of connecting to Hashem really opens our eyes about ourselves and to make us understand that, that there is a cruise of pure oil. And very soon we'll be reunited physically with our Rebbe becoming Mashiach. And meanwhile, tonight, till Mashiach comes, if, if Chas Shom is delayed, we have to look and find that cruise of pure oil, the purity we have inside of us. And with that power, we have to light the menorah in ourselves, in the world, in the base of Migdash, and we should see it happen tonight, Mamash. A good vach and a good yantif. Yeah. So I found the building.